Hello, everyone, and welcome to Taking Charge of Your Future, Finding and Applying for Summer Research Experiences. I'm Michael David, and I'll be your host for this evening's broadcast, which is being produced by the ACS Undergrad Programs and the Younger Chemist Committee. Summer research experiences can play a key role in your chemistry education, as well as your career. But how do you find a program and present a strong application? This evening, we will be joined by Gloria Thomas, who is the Executive Director of Research, Education, and Mentoring Programs at the Office of Strategic Initiatives at the Louisiana State University. Gloria is going to cover the benefits of a summer research experience, as well as give some tips on how to make your application stand out. Our moderator will be Greg Lynn Gibbs, the chair-elect at the ACS Lay Valley Local Section and ACS Student Chapter Advisor at Penn State Berks. And now, with no further ado, let me turn things over to Gloria to get things started. Good evening. It's so good to see so many of you here. I see Luke, Manuel, Jean, Irna. I see Cedarcrest. I see Penn State and Eastern Illinois, um, Southwest Minnesota so far. They've kind of said hello in the question box. Um, it's, it's exciting to have so many students and um, perhaps staff and faculty there supporting them that are all eager to hear about undergraduate research experiences. As we get started, I want to let you know that the slides are available on um, the careers, College to Career website. So if you want to download them and follow along or to check them out after um, the presentation, be sure to do that. And as another ad for the Younger Chemist Committee, of which I was a member before I got too old and they threw me off, um, literally they do. Uh, save the date, the next ACS Program in a Box event is on February 29th. Um, there's a web uh, link there uh, that you can check out the Program in the Box sponsored by the YCC. So if we get on to the main event, what we're going to talk about are uh, the following things. Why do you want to do summer research? What types of experiences are out there? I saw one question already about uh, where would you do an undergraduate research program and how you would apply. We're going to talk about that. Programs can vary, so we're going to talk about typical programs and general requirements for getting into summer research programs. And then I'll share some tips that the committee's put together on finding a research experience, but more so finding the right research experience for you and submitting an application. We'll finish up with Kisses of Death. Um, I'm sure you're looking forward to hearing about that. And other considerations that you might want to uh, take into account as you're planning your next summer. But as we're getting started, I'm really curious to hear from you. Why do you want to do summer research? What do you hope to gain? What led you to sign on for this webinar tonight? You can go right into your chat box and answer. What really drives you to want to do a summer research program? No answer is the wrong answer. We're just kind of curious to see what students are interested in. So you can go right into the chat box and type in your response. And usually when I talk to students, they have lots of different reasons why they want to get involved in undergraduate research, particularly during the summer, which can be very different than doing research at your own home institution during the academic year. It looks like a lot of you are really interested in getting experience. That's a great reason. Someone said it took them a little while to find the chat box, but they're on now. Gaining valuable insights about graduate school. What possibilities there are in the field, that's an excellent reason getting more experience, resume building, experience beyond the classroom, all excellent responses, excellent reasons. Uh, someone shared they're from a smaller school and they want to see what a major research institution is like. Gaining some experience and finding out what sort of chemistry you like. I have to tell you, I did a summer research program um, in between my junior and senior year doing organic synthesis with brominated and chlorinated molecules. I bleached half my clothes that summer and decided I was not that good of an organic chemist and I went into analytical chemistry and sometimes these experiences are a good place to find that out. Networking, making good connections, great reasons. And I think you all have 
hit upon some of the major things that um, are, are great reasons to go in. Learn, learn, learn. What you do in the lab really reinforces the theory that you've learned in the classroom. Experiencing chemistry in a quote, real world, unquote, setting. Doing research in the lab is nothing like your classwork. It's nothing like the laboratory courses you take in organic chemistry or physical chemistry. Getting the excitement of discovery, um, that's an excellent reason. What you do in a research lab are things that are not in the textbooks. You're charting your own course, exploring a new area of research, trying out a new school, preparing for graduate school. Many of you shared those. If you'd like to see other reasons um, and other things to consider as you're considering summer research, there's a link shared on the screen on the ACS website that will give you some more ideas about why you might want to do research, why you want to commit your summer uh, to somewhere else. There are lots of different types of summer research experiences. There are summer research experiences that happen in different sectors of the chemical um, enterprise. Academic, I think, is what many of you were referring to in trying out a new school for, that you might be considering for graduate school or seeing what research is like at a big school if you're from a smaller or liberal arts school. There are also summer research experiences that happen in industry. There are, few, there are a few national labs that offer summer research experiences as well. And so you can look at a very broad array of institutions for summer research programs. In the past, there have been summer research programs that happen at museums as well. So you want to think broadly about the type of uh, institution that you might go to for a summer research program. There are other ways that summer research experiences vary as well. Summer research experiences can vary depending on the funding source. There are federally funded programs, like those funded by the National Science Foundation called Research Experience for Undergraduates, REUs, you may have heard a lot about. And there are some that are funded by the institution. The goals of the program may vary along with the funding source. So, for example, a program that is funded by the National Science Foundation is going to focus on very basic science. A program funded by the National Institutes of Health is going to be focused more on biomedical related research as opposed to fundamental basic science. Also, the nature of the research can vary. If you go to do a research experience in an, in an industrial setting, excuse me, with a company, if you were at a pharmaceutical company, you can expect to be doing research that's very applied and related to the goals of that, uh, that company, as opposed to being in an academic setting. There are some things that are fairly basic about the types of programs. Um, for example, the program is usually structured to provide round-trip travel paid for you by the program. So they will pay for you to fly to that site, wherever it is, at the beginning of the summer, and they'll pay for your travel at the end of the summer to go home. Now, if you want to take trips home for the 4th of July or for weddings, then those are usually on your own expenses. Something to keep in mind is that the flights are usually coordinated by the program. In most cases, they will pay for your flight or make arrangements with a travel agency for you to set up your flight, and there's not much out-of-pocket expense for you but they might have a limit or an allowance on how much they're going to cover. So some programs may say they'll cover your flight up to $400 or up to $500. Programs can also vary in the duration of time. Some are as short as six weeks, but typically they're between eight to ten weeks. You can expect to spend eight to ten weeks on site at that location at least five days a week for no less than a 40-hour work week. The stipends can vary between $3,000 to $5,000. A lot of programs kind of average out around $500 a week. Typically, especially if you're at a university, you'll be housed in a dormitory. You may have to share a room or you may have a single room. Many programs will allow a food allowance or they may offer you a campus meal plan. And then some programs even offer academic credit. But all of these are things to consider as you're con looking at different programs and considering different programs. For example, if a program were just six weeks, 
um, paying three thousand dollars you want to normalize that with respect to how much you're going to get per week with a stipend whether they're going to pay for your housing directly or whether it comes out of your stipend if they're going to offer you a campus meal plan As you're applying for REUs, there are certain requirements in place, depending on the type of program again. Some programs will have a GPA restriction. They may say in their requirements that you must have a 3.0 GPA or 3.5 GPA. They may restrict that GPA to within your major or into your major chemistry classes. Some programs will ask for a transcript. That could be an unofficial version of the transcript or an official version. So you want to make sure you look at those application requirements so that you request your transcripts early enough if an official transcript is required. Many programs will ask for an essay or a statement of purpose. And we're going to talk about that in a little more detail tonight. Letters of recommendation are pretty much required for most programs. Depending on the type of research experience, Course completions may be required, so some programs may say that you must have completed organic chemistry or you must have completed analytical chemistry. Certain programs will look for gender, race, and ethnicity depending on the type of program. For example, any program funded by a federal agency, a, a United States federal agency, is going to require that you are a citizen or permanent resident of the United States. Some international opportunities, pretty much all international opportunities, are going to require a passport and a student visa. And those are two different types of processes to obtain a passport but to obtain a student visa. The student visa restrictions will vary from country to country. So you'll work with the program in a lot of detail to get all of those things done very early for international opportunities. When I did an internship in um, industry, I took a physical exam, which is a little different than some of the academic research experiences. That physical exam was required because I was working in a, uh, an environment that had a pilot plant. Um, it wasn't a rigorous physical test like an army boot camp, but I just wanted to mention it, um, depending on what type of environment you're in, you may have to do a physical exam at the first, beginning of the summer and one at the end of the summer. Many programs, especially those that are funded by the National Science Foundation or academic institutions, will require an interest in attending graduate school. The goals of those programs are to encourage students to get research experience to go on to graduate school. And so they may have that as a requirement of their program, and they'll be looking for that interest and evaluating your interest through your essays, through your statements of purpose, through your letters of recommendation. Also, mo many programs will require that you are still an undergraduate during the subsequent semester. So some programs will not accept an undergraduate student who is graduating in May, receiving a bachelor's degree, and then um, not being enrolled in an undergraduate program the following fall. But that very, uh, varies depending on the type of site that you're looking at. So I saw lots of questions asking, how do you find an experience? You already know you want to do it. You know you have some of the qualifications and requirements to get started in research. How do you find them? You have to talk to everyone who will listen. Talk to your research uh, advisors on campus. Talk to your academic advisor. Talk to your friends to find out uh, where they're finding their experiences. And talk to your professors. All of your professors have been to uh, graduate school at many different institutions across the country, they'll have ideas for you on how to find research experiences in the areas you're interested in. Search the internet. There are a few websites that we wanted to bring to your attention. The links are on the web uh, slide. They're on the slide, and all the slides are on the web. Um, the National Science Foundation has a clearinghouse for their programs. If you go to that nsf.gov website, you can put in the search engine, the particular part of the country that you want to do research in. You could put in that um, you're interested in material science or you're interested in 
um, physical chemistry, you can get as specific to what type of research that you're interested in. The Institute for Broadening um, Experience uh, Pathways to Science.org has a wonderful website that is updated every year. They literally comb institutions across the nation and list all the undergraduate research programs that they can find as well as their deadlines. Those will be funded by the National Science Foundation, the NIH, or by different institutions. The Council on Undergraduate Research also has an excellent website that has a lot of resources for finding uh, undergraduate research programs, and WebGuru is another fantastic one. Colleges and universities will list their websites. Literally, you can Google um, at my previous institution, Xavier University of Louisiana, I didn't, I didn't see anyone sign in from uh, Louisiana yet, but uh, you could Google Xavier University of Louisiana summer programs and find all of the summer research programs at that institution. That's also true for Louisiana State University and most other major universities. But you want to cast a broad net and you want to cast a wide net. And you also want to make sure that you apply for more than one program. When I ran a National Science Foundation funded REU program at Mississippi State University, we received somewhere between 200 and 250 applications every year for 20 spots in our program. So you may not get into your first pick. You may not get into your second pick. Make sure that you apply for two or three programs because each program is going to be looking for a different type of student, and you may be that particular type of student. I see Centenary College just signed in. I'm glad Louisiana is representing tonight. So you've seen these websites. There are lots of opportunities to apply for. How do you know which one's going to work for you? Make sure that you pick a program that has the research goals that fit your future goals. If you're interested in medical school, you don't want to apply for a research program that is geared for students interested in graduate school. In that case, you're not going to get the training and not going to get all the resources that are going to get you to your future goals. Think about the things that you like or don't like about your current institution. Think about who you, who's going to supervise you in that summer program and how you will be supervised. If it's a major research university with very large research groups, you may not be supervised directly by the professor or advisor of that research group. You might be working very closely with a graduate student or with a postdoc in that group. Think about formal mentoring components. Does the program have a structured mentoring plan? On the program website, do they talk about mentoring and the importance of mentoring in their program? And do they offer course credits? My REU did offer academic credit in a research course that you could transfer back to your home institution. So you want to look for those types of opportunities. Most summer programs are going to organize social activities and networking opportunities for you. You're going to go away from home. You may be the only, only student from your institution to go to this research program in rural Wyoming to look at uh, environmental science. And so the advisors of these programs are very conscious of that, and there'll be lots of activities for you to network, to engage with your peers, um, and to explore the area. The timing of the program is something else you want to think about. Some international programs have timing that is a little different than the domestic programs. Also, there are some programs that are seasonal. For example, if you want to do a research experience in Antarctica, there's a certain window in the weather and the time of year. So make sure you look at that program. They're going to be six to ten weeks, typically at least eight to ten weeks, and you're going to be expected to be there that full time. It's not unusual for a student to want to go home for the Fourth of July holiday or maybe to go home once for a wedding or some other important family event. But expect to be at that program for the full eight to ten weeks and make sure that the timing of that program matches up with your academic calendar and some of the other commitments that you have. 
Finding that right opportunity means looking at the benefits and the stipends. Be sure to keep in mind that the cost of living is different in every area. $5,000 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana is very different than $5,000 in Boston, Massachusetts. I consider the culture of the research group and even the department. Consider the work hours. Typically, the work day, um, 9 to 5, is what you can expect as a minimum. Consider the flexibility. Consider diversity of the research group. If you're going from a very small um, institution and moving into a much larger institution for the summer, start thinking about the types of different people that you'll be working with. Uh, perhaps you're from a small town, small college in the Midwest, and you do research at a Hispanic serving institution. You want to make sure that you're aware of all the cultural expectations and the new environments that you're going to get for the summer. And the summer is a wonderful time to try something new. Web Guru at um, Northeastern University has a, a website that has a lot of other questions that you want to ask yourself as you're picking out the summer research program for you. The program that your roommate picks out may not be the best program for you. So you know why you want to do research. You've got some ideas now on how to find an opportunity and what questions you need to ask. How do you submit the most competitive application to get you into your top choice? Start researching opportunities early. And you're going to hear me say that a few more times before we're done tonight. Start early. You also want to pay attention to the application requirements. If there are GPA requirements, pay attention. Make sure you send your transcripts. Most will ask for your current college institution, but you may want to ask the question if you've taken courses at different colleges or transferred recently. Make sure if they say you need to have organic chemistry done that you have taken organic chemistry lecture and lab. Pay attention to all the different components of the application, especially letters of recommendation and especially any statements of purpose. Lastly, make sure that you pay attention to deadlines. The deadlines for summer research programs are hard deadlines, and you need to make sure that you request those letters of recommendation very early. Some of the deadlines can be as early as November, but most of them will have concluded by March 1st. So you can't wait until April to start thinking about what you want to do for the summer nor can you write the most competitive statement of purpose that's going to get you into that top choice when you start on it the night before it's due. Some programs are going to ask for a resume. Get help in preparing your resume. Make sure you have your school and your permanent address, your email address. Most people will include a mobile number and their LinkedIn profile. You want to include your current and previous courses. You don't want to necessarily list organic lecture first semester, organic lab first semester, but you might write organic lecture and lab two semesters. Your work history, particularly work that's relevant to your academic goals and your research interest, any awards and honors, and extracurricular services and activities. You also want to list references on your resume. Your resume should start looking like a curriculum vitae, a professional curriculum vitae is what a chemist would use. And so you want to make sure that your resume meets all the expectations um, that we tend to see of resumes in the professional field. There are no errors, and your resume is accurate. A statement of purpose is also extremely important. Your statement of purpose needs to be very targeted and focused on your background, your interests, your research goals, all around your academic interests and your research interests. It should describe the scientists that you think you want to become. And every paragraph has got to be related to that research area interest. Any personal information needs to be tied back into your scientific approach, the things that turn you on about doing research, your inquisitive nature and your curiosity. 
Personal information that's not relevant should be minimized, but you do want to have some personality come across in your statement of purpose. Your statement of purpose is generally read by faculty that are associated with that program or research scientists that are associated with that program. And so remember that you're talking to, in a lot of cases, chemistry faculty. What would they be interested um, in? Why would they be interested in having you come to their research lab for the summer? The most common mistake I see with statements of purpose is that students will go to some med school seminar or um, another health-related program, and they try to write a statement of purpose that would be more appropriate for medical school. So if you read medical school applications, the essays tend to be something like, when I was three years old, I stubbed my toe, and I've been pondering the philosophical nature of pain ever since. You really want to keep your statement of purpose focused on chemistry research or, what, or whatever your academic discipline is and your curiosity about research. That's going to come across to a group of faculty or other professionals who are evaluating your application to do research as they do research. In the statement of purpose, you want to have a general introduction. What's your interest? What sparked your desire to do research? What is it that makes you curious about a particular area of research? You also want to summarize any previous research. Talk about the research that you've done. What general area did you do that research in, um, in terms of the research focus? Was it more organic synthesis? Was it more analytical characterization of products? Um, was it more theory-driven computational? You want to talk about your responsibilities and your contribution to that project and the outcome of the project. At the end of the summer, you were able to characterize uh, your synthesized product with a particular type of yield. Make sure that you write a very technical presentation of that research, because remember, scientists are going to read these essays. If you worked on an important paper, you had a thesis, um, maybe you were able to present your work to your department or within a group meeting, you might want to mention that. And particularly in the areas of research that are related to the work that you want to do at this new institution, you want to highlight that. You want to talk about your current activities and how any activities have related back to your studies and your goals. Make sure you elaborate on the topic that you want to pursue. For example, if you're applying to a, an REU program at an institution in Texas, many fine institutions in Texas, look at all the program faculty that are associated with that particular summer experience and you might want to write in detail that Professor X is doing really exciting work on um, environmental fate of pharmaceuticals. And I'm really interested in this area. His recent paper on this area um, really raised some other questions I'd like to ask. Or I saw Professor X give a talk and she was extremely motivational and I've been really thinking about this area of research. If you can tie your interest into something that someone at that institution is doing, that faculty member is going to perk up and take a lot more interest in your particular application. Make sure you keep all of your um, applications very positive. You might not like your current institution or not have a lot of research experiences at your current institution. Maybe you had a bad summer experience at a different institution. You don't want to write about that in your um, statement of purpose. You want to put as positive a spin, as truthful a spin as you can on all of your um, applications. Maybe you want to talk about your eagerness to get other research experiences. So we talked about the statement of purpose. Another really, really important part is the letters of recommendation. And I'm going to ask our host, Greg Lynn, to probe this a little more with you. 
Hello, now it's time for our poll question. I just want to let all of you in the audience know that you can click directly on your screen to give your input. Letters of recommendation are best obtained from any professor or supervisor at my institution, any professor or supervisor in my department, a professor I've taken class with and gotten a good grade, a professor that knows my technical skills and potential, or it doesn't really matter as long as I get one. And we are going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Wow. Well, Gloria, it looks like we have everyone agreeing that it's most important to get a letter of recommendation from a professor that knows their technical skills and potential, which is, which is great to hear. That is exciting. You guys are right on the money. Um, mistakes that students will make is having that history teacher that really took an interest in you write a letter. Or sometimes students will get uh, someone at a volunteer organization. They volunteered to um, feed the homeless at one of the shelters in their area and they'll get someone to write a letter. You want to make sure that your letters come from faculty who know you and I'm glad that you guys have responded in that way. Um, get to know your faculty. Good letters, a, a letter of recommendation can make or break you. Um, you need to ask research advisors, professors or supervisors who know your capabilities, and I know that some of you are here because you want to get that first research experience. If you don't already have a research advisor or a professor that you've done research with, it's better to ask one of your lab instructors. So when I taught um, analytical chemistry, I go to lecture and there might be 70 to 80 students in my quant class. It's hard to get to know them one-on-one. -on -one. But the 20 or so who took my particular lab section, I spent four hours a week for the 12 weeks of uh, that semester, getting to know those students and knowing their technical capabilities in the lab. So if you haven't done research already, make sure you go to some of your lab instructors. But start now getting to know your faculty, talking with them about your interest, particularly about your interest in research or your interest in getting a graduate degree. Get to know them now. There are a number of people you should not ask. Um, someone who doesn't know your science capabilities, and if you goofed off in their class, you don't want to ask them. Uh, remarkably, I had a student that uh, plagiarized a lab report in my course, and she had to go through the academic misconduct process at our institution, and then later she asked me to write her a letter. Um, what you need to know is that faculty will write letters that reflect what they know about you, and I told that young woman, um, I would be happy to supply a letter for you. However, I have to write what I know about you and your capabilities. Um, and more and more applications um, are being screened for ethics. Um, they want to know if you're ethical, if, you're, if you have integrity. So faculty will write what they know. If they don't know anything about you, they will write, Susie seems to be a very sweet girl. She took my class. She scored uh, a B. She wrote well. I think she might be a fine addition to your program. That letter is not worth much. Also, you can get your uh, faculty who are writing letters of recommendation for you to explain any challenges you've had. For example, I knew a student who struggled through their first two years because they were working full time to help a mother, um, to help their mother and help their family out with bills. Later, they got a scholarship that allowed them not to work um, outside of school anymore, and their grades just started soaring. So you don't want to do that in your statement of purpose, but you might ask someone, an advisor or a mentor who knows you well, to be able to explain that in a letter, to say, I've known this student since they were a freshman, they had some challenges, they've overcome that particular challenge, and here's how I've seen them grow and mature and how their academic progress has really excelled. So there are flaws that can happen along the way, but they can um, be addressed. So you want to avoid the kisses of death. A kiss of death is to appear, appear un, uninformed. If you write a statement of purpose, a generic statement of purpose, and you send it to uh, National Lab X and you talk about nanotechnology and that, you know, that institution doesn't do any research in nanotechnology, you're going to look pretty uninformed. 
bad letters of recommendation are a kiss of death, you want to be able to ask faculty, are you able to write a very strong letter of recommendation for the summer program that I'm really interested in? If they say no, thank them for their time and ask someone else. Have others review your personal statements. If you have academic problems, you want to address them. Don't have any errors, typos, or conflicting information, please. Make sure that your social media presence is a positive and professional social media presence. I've called students to offer them a spot in my summer program, and their voicemail was the most inappropriate message to have someone calling um, for, on a professional purpose. So you want to make sure you clean up your voicemail, make sure your email address is a very professional email address on your resume or CV, and make sure your social media presence is professional, um, or in the least locked down with lots of privacy settings. Um, other things to take into consideration, sometimes funding can fall short and a program is canceled. Pay attention to your emails. Um, some programs you will see will say, we anticipate accepting 10 students summer 2015. That type of program means they've applied for funding from a federal agency and they haven't quite yet heard back if they're going to be funded or not. And they may not know until January or February. So make sure that you read all the fine print um, on the websites and call and ask questions if you have questions. Uh, deadlines are often short and you may not hear about the opportunities at the same time. For example, you might have applied to one program on February 1st and another one on March 15th. You may get an offer from one and you still haven't heard from the other one, but that's okay. Communication is key. Keep in contact with the director or the coordinator. If you need to, call them up and say, I just received an offer from another program, but I'm really interested in attending your program. Can you tell me what the timeline is for you making offers? Sometimes they'll be able to tell you, we've already made our first round of offers, and I don't know that you're going to make, um, make the cut. Or they'll tell you, I'm sorry, we've decided to decline your application. If you need more time, ask, but do so politely. Um, be aware that companies and universities use these summer programs as a screening tool. They make their hires from these programs or they admit to graduate school for these, for the, for these programs. So make sure you make the use, the best use of any opportunity. And then when you finish the summer, make sure you stay in touch with uh, the faculty so that you can get great letters of recommendation la later. When you go home to your home institution to finish out your junior and senior years, Make sure you write back every now and again to ask, how did that paper come along that I contributed to? Or I'm going to be attending the ACS meeting in, I think we're going to San Francisco next, or Denver next. Will you be there? Could we meet up and have coffee? So it's time to get going. You need to start identifying programs today. Remember there are applications that are due as early as November and December. Typically, applications are due between the middle of February, uh, excuse me, the middle of January to early March. But maybe your top program has an application in December, so you want to start early. Apply to something that's low-hanging fruit, something that is a peer institution. Um, they take students with first time or, or no research experience. Um, maybe it's someone that your professor knows and they'll write a great letter or get you in. Apply to something in the mid-range and then apply to that like top program at the top institution in the specialty that you're interested in um, because you never know what you might get into. Uh, talk to faculty and advisors. Start talking to them right now about letters of recommendation. They may want you to come in and talk about your goals and you want to be able to do that early. Start working on your resume, start working on your personal statements, make lots of revisions, um, and get lots of people to read it and to give you feedback, particularly your mentors and your research advisors or academic advisors. We're going to take some questions in just a minute, but if you have additional questions, um, if you think of something in the next few days, send a tweet to at ACS undergrad. And either I or Greg Lynn will respond to your questions. Um, we'll be posting them at ACS Undergrad 
at wordpress.com. You can get these slides on the College to Careers website. Just Google ACS College to Careers. But for those burning questions you have right now and those that you've been um, entering, we're going to take them. You can enter them into the question box. Type them right on in. Greg Lynn's been screening those and looking at those uh, as you've been entering them. And we'll get to them as many as time allows. But you can also tweet us. Um, I am at Louisiana State University. Greg Lynn is at Penn State Berks. You could Google either one of us and email us. But we'll be looking at those at ACS undergrad tweets uh, for all of your questions. So I think Greg Lang has been compiling some of those questions. Yes, I have, Gloria, and we have some really good questions. Um, some of these questions that we received you already answered, um, but we'll just run through a few that we already have. Lauren Arndt uh, asked, what happens if the program that you're interested in doesn't have their applications out yet? That's a great question. What I would do is I would look at their website to determine when the applications were due last year. So if their applications were due February 15th last year for 2014, they might be on the same timeline for last year. So that will give you an idea of their timeline. Not that they, they may move it up or they may move it back, but that will give you an idea. Also, ask them, you can call and ask if it's not on the website, what components of their application they'll be looking for so that you can start working on yours early. Um, it's not uncommon to just cold call someone um, in the department or uh, the coordinator of the program to ask questions. So if they don't have their applications out yet, that doesn't mean you're going to wait until they do post them because they not, may not post them late because you want to start early. So give them a cold call, send an email, or look at what they had available last year. That's great advice. Um, I see some questions that have popped up about LinkedIn. So we have a, question, a couple of questions. I'm going to try to combine them. Uh, Professor Dan Swartling asked um, if we could please emphasize the importance of having a LinkedIn page. And um, in conjunction with that, or related to that, we have uh, Professor Jean Burke of Cedar Quest asking, should a student be on LinkedIn as an undergrad? Yes, absolutely. You want to start building your professional profile now. You want to bill yourself as a chemistry scholar, um, as an undergraduate scholar. If you're on a, a scholarship or in a special program, you want to be able to highlight that. More and more recruiters and employers are looking for your social media presence. And I heard someone, um, a professor of journalism, say, if you, you want to make sure that 80% of what anyone finds for you on the internet is stuff that you've put out there. So you need to make sure you have a LinkedIn profile, that it is kept up to date, and that it is accurate. You want to make sure that if you have Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever the young people are doing these days, that that account is kept very professionally. So many employers and recruiters are going right to Facebook and they see your profile picture that's uh, completely inappropriate uh, and they're building their impressions of you for that. So you want to start protecting your brand and you want to start building your bank brand. And LinkedIn is the way that professionals are doing that today. So um, I agree with uh, Dan Swartling. You need to have a LinkedIn page. Um, you need to keep it updated. And ACS has a lot of resources about LinkedIn. Um, there was a great webinar done live at one of the recent national meetings about LinkedIn and how to build your LinkedIn page in a professional way. Okay, um, I would like to give you another question, Gloria. This is a pretty good one. Brandon Lund wants to know, does prior experience aid you in getting accepted into a summer research pro um, program? Does it aid you? Um, I don't think so. You want to make sure you look at what type of program it is. For, for example, the program at Xavier University, the National Science Foundation funded REU at Xavier, was for first-time researchers. Um, I know a program that uh, Ben Zhang runs in New York that is specifically for 
uh, students from small liberal arts colleges with no research experience as well. For those particular programs, if you have past experience, you should not apply. You're not their target audience. But past experience will be a great way to show that you've done research um, for a semester or two and you're ready really to contribute. Maybe you want to drive um, your next research experience to producing a publication or publication quality data. So make sure that you highlight that. that. That can be a very great strength in many applications. In particular for international experiences, I don't know of any international research experience program that takes students who have not had research experience. For example, I'm co-PI on the France and Belgium REU program um, in Europe. And in particular, we look for students who have had past research experience and are now able to really contribute to publications or to proposals that their faculty will be writing. And I think more okay, getting to the yeah, age questions, uh, getting to the age question, I've had students that were non-traditional students in my REU program. Um, I had a rising sophomore once, so they've been um, young enough to have just completed their freshman year and get into research, and I've had students who have been older, that have had children, that have had spouses. Um, so there's a wide variety of people that get engaged and will really benefit from a summer program. Okay, Gloria. Um, thank you very much. That was great. I think we have another really good question here from Laura Satterfield. Would a lab TA be a good reference? She says that she saw her lab TA more than her professor. I would discourage that personally. In my experience, I don't want to necessarily see a graduate student writing a letter for you. I would rather see the professor. Um, so even though the TA was really the one in the classroom every day grading the lab reports, there's um, some faculty advisor that was responsible for that class on the record or some faculty that coordinated the lab. They could write a letter in tandem. For example, that TA could supply lots of examples about your creativity in the lab or your technical skill in the lab and have that faculty member write it. I could easily see that. Um, I don't know if I've, I've seen examples where the postdoc or the graduate student in the lab was the one working with a researcher, but the faculty member wrote the letter and said, you know, this, this student worked very closely with my postdoc, Dr. X. Dr. X reports that she was really able to contribute to this problem we were having in the lab with a creative and innovative fix for a gas leak or some other thing. So you want to make sure that it's a faculty member that submits it, but they can very much refer to the recommendation of a TA or a graduate assistant or a postdoc. Um, we have another question from Professor Jean Burke. Uh, she would like to know, if a student cannot get an internship, would job shadowing be worthwhile? Well, the job shadowing would definitely be better than um, working at Kinko's for the summer or working outside the field for the summer. If you don't get into a research program, there may be opportunities locally. Um, where you could get a little involved and get um, engaged in research. So you want to make sure to talk to faculty in your department and also look locally. Um, if you're in the Gulf South, um, as I am in Louisiana, there's lots of chemical industry here uh, throughout the Northeast. There's lots of big pharmaceutical companies. You may be able to find um, those types of opportunities. If you get started early, though, and you write a great statement of purpose that you've had help from your mentors and your faculty, uh, and you apply early, uh, at least by the deadlines, you should be able to find a paying opportunity, but definitely make advantage of every opportunity you can, even if it is a volunteer opportunity. Gloria, we have another question from Maria Graber. I don't know if, we, if you touched on this. Uh, specifically, but she would like to know how many months before a summer experience would you recommend applying? 
Those deadlines are going to be early spring. Typically, they're from the middle uh, or early January to early March. So typical deadlines are January 15, February 1, February 15. From January to the middle to the beginning or middle of March are going to be typical deadlines. But there are some that are as early as November and December. So you want to make sure that you start looking now. It's October 21st. You want to get a heads up on what those deadlines are so that you can start working on your applications and revising those statements of purpose, getting feedback on those applications very early. So start looking now, but, but uh, count on deadlines being somewhere in the beginning of January to early March, typically. Okay, and uh, Maria has quite a few good questions. Another one of them is, are there specific applications for the, the different summer research experiences? Yes, there are different applications. Most programs will have their own application program. Um, I know of a couple of programs that will allow you to send one application to apply to many programs at their institution. But across the nation, most programs are going to have their own application process and their own application requirements. Okay, and uh, we have time for uh, one or two more questions if anyone would like to send one in. But in the meantime, um, what happens if your, your letter of reference, um, something happens to the person writing it where they're delayed or they wind up getting sick? What backup plan would you recommend for a student in that situation? Well, you want to start early. Um, Usually, I like to have at least a couple of weeks' notice as a minimum so that I can start pulling together a letter uh, of recommendation for you that I can meet with you to talk about your plans for graduate school because otherwise I can't speak to that at all in the letter that I'm writing. Um, also, you don't know what travel plans your faculty may have. Maybe they have a really big research proposal that's due soon or maybe they're writing a new exam for one of their classes that's going to take up a lot of their time. So first you want to make sure you start early. Have I said that enough tonight? Start early. Um, two, you might want to gently remind them a week before the deadline and maybe two days before the deadline. Um, don't go overboard though. I had a student once that emailed me every day for two weeks and I I wanted to jump off the roof. <laughs> so make sure you don't, you're not obnoxious, you're not too demanding. Be very um, appreciative of the time that they're going to take to write a very thoughtful and positive letter for you. Um, if something happens that that faculty member falls ill just before the deadline, write the program to say, Professor X was prepared to write a letter of recommendation for me, and I've just learned that she um, has become ill or she's going to be away from the institution for some time. I'd like to get a different letter for you, but I'd like to give that person a week to write the letter. Would you accept a letter late? Make sure that you communicate with the program and that you communicate with the faculty as well. Thank you, Gloria. I think that is our last question, and I would like to remind all the students um, in attendance and professors, if you have any questions, please just uh, hit us on Twitter with your question. Um, I believe uh, it was, there we are, tweet at ACS undergrad, and uh, Gloria and I will do our best to uh, answer every question that comes up. Um, please, some patience if, if we get a lot of questions, um, but we will do our best. and. Uh, Gloria, before I, I ask you for your final thoughts, I would just like to say thank you to ACS Webinars for making this possible, ACS Undergrad also for making this possible, um, the ACS Younger Chemist Committee for their co-sponsorship for this program, and Professor Jeffrey Evansack at Duquesne University uh, for all his contributions in the development of this program. So Gloria, I'm going to hand it over to you for final thoughts, and I'd like to personally thank everyone for attending. I am so excited for all of you getting engaged in research. Uh, that's the most thrilling part about being a chemist and being able to contribute to science. Um, 
I can remember all three of my academic, my uh, summer research experiences and how they contributed to developing my research interest away from organic chemistry, as I told you, and more to bioanalytical research, but also all the friends and all the um, contacts that I made uh, across the nation as I did summer programs. I wish you all the best of luck. I uh, hope you get into uh, your top programs and that you have a fantastic summer. But start early, and if you have questions, please send, us to us. send them to us. We'd love to hear from you.